Hi everyone, really happy to be here today to share with you the topic I like the most after Game of Thrones, which is regenerative agriculture. My name is Ben, and I am one of the co-founders of saint Green, a French Moroccan startup that cultivates desert thanks to regenerative agriculture. Before we start, let me ask you a question. What are the two things we really need in life? And just a hint, money is not an answer. Love might be an answer. This, this is really cute. Uh, the two things we really need in life is food and water. And this is one of the reasons why our ancestors created agriculture. 10,000 years ago, our ancestors, Homo sapiens, flew from Africa to the rest of the world, and they found a great place. Very luxurious, very green, with good soil, a lot of water, which is called Mesopotamia, also known as the Fertile Crescent. And so they decided to set up over there and start doing agriculture, cultivating wheat, barley, as well as doing livestock farming. It's a huge moment in human history because we switch from an hunter-gatherer society to a, sedentary, a society of sedentary people. And to do so, they chopped down trees to do fields and pastures. And in 10,000 years, they managed to go from this to that. So from a fertile lands to a barren lands. Come on, from a Homo sapiens point of view, living today in the 21st century, century they did a shitty job. Come on, what they did in 10,000 years, we can do it in 100 years. Indeed, today, we've never been so good at depleting soil, at chopping down the trees with great machine. And what they achieve in 10,000 years, we can do it so much faster. And you can see it from satellite analysis. So in 36 years, we had huge impact. We deforested Amazon forest and many of the forests to do agriculture. But this is not the only thing we did. The other example, which is really cool, I love it, Aral Sea, located in Kazakhstan. So in 1984, Kazakhstan was part of the Soviet Union. And they thought, OK, we do have water. Maybe we should do crops cultivation. What about doing cotton? It's really high water intensive. So yeah, let's do cotton. And so in 36 years, they managed to go from a nice biodiversity sea to a barren lands. Those two examples show the impact of human activity on our planet. And those impacts have a process which is called deforestation. Desertification, sorry, which is close to deforestation. And desertification is killing each year 12 million hectares of arable lands. 12 million hectares. This is like one football field every two seconds. So because we've been so good at doing deforestation that increase desertification. Maybe in a few decades, our planet is going to look like this. Like this. Yes. What a legacy for the future generation. We can be proud. No, joking apart. What if we change paradigm on agriculture? Remember, you listen at school. Agriculture is about growing plants and trees. The plants and trees are doing photosynthesis that capture carbon into the soil and the tree, that increase fertility of the soil, and that also produce food. So what, instead of having agriculture sectors that produce 25% of global greenhouse emissions, we use agriculture as an ally to fight climate change? This is called regenerative agriculture. So if we take a proper definition of the FAO, regenerative agriculture describes holistic farming system that, among other benefits, improve water and hair quality, enhance ecosystem biodiversity, produce nutrient-dense food, and store carbon to help mitigate the effect of climate change. These farm systems are designed to work in harmony with nature while also maintaining and improving economical availability. So let's stop two seconds now. 
to focus more on conventional agriculture. So conventional agriculture is a highly uh, mechanized agriculture with huge machines that are going to compact the soil so the water cannot go into it anymore and you can lose the biodiversity. Conventional agriculture is also about using a lot of chemical entrants such as fertilizer, pesticide, that can kill the biodiversity and the more you use it, the more you need to use some of them because you need to replace biodiversity. So the question is, why did we adopt conventional agriculture? And instead of thinking of why, let's think of when. When did you adopt conventional agriculture? We did that just after World War II, when we had a lot of economic growth, a lot of demand for food, because we have a lot of increase in population, so we need to meet this demand. We also need to switch industry from a war industry into something new. This is why tank manufacturers become agricultural machine manufacturers, such as Caterpillar. This is why chemical boom manufacturer became chemical entrant for agriculture, such as BASF. So everything has been highly subsidized by government because they needed to improve the yield of agriculture to feed an ever-growing population. And this is great in the short term, but in the long term, it doesn't work. So let's finish the comparison between conventional and regenerative by watching this uh, illustration. Uh, by the way, it's from a, a great movie, which is called Kiss the Ground, available on Netflix. And I think this is the best movie of Maxim from Catalyst Farm. I don't know if he's here. Um, so if you're looking at the illustration, you can see from one side, so the roots are developing well, everything is going well. On the other side, the soil is dead. Why? Because pesticide kills the soil, because mechanization compacts the soil, so there is no water intrusion anymore. And what is really important to look also is the sky. You can see that regenerative agriculture can maintain water cycle and increase precipitation. On the other side, if you're looking at conventional agriculture, what a shame. There is no precipitation anymore. We create deserts, as we've been seeing with Mesopotamia. So let's focus a bit more on benefits of regenerative agriculture. So it's doing carbon sequestration through different methods, such as agroforestry, no tillage, cover crop, and many other techniques. It does also improve yields and, and profitability of farms. It is also important to mention that this is high qualitative nutrient based. So think about your body as a nice car. Let's say you're buying a Ferrari. I don't know how much it costs, like one million, something like this. You spend one million buying this great Ferrari. Are you going to fill this car with shitty fuel? No, you're going to fill it with the best fuel you can find on the market. It's the same for your body. You just have one body. If you want your body to work properly, if you want your brain to work properly, you need to fill it with the best nutrients you can find. Something else also is like, Regenerative agriculture improve biodiversity and natural capital, which is really important because it's becoming an economical asset. So let's take a look at a few examples now. This one is really great in terms of like, whoa, effect. So it's a couple in Brazil that restored with 2 million trees their property in 18 years. Come on, looks cool, right? Would you prefer to live over there or over there? Second example that I really love because it's so low-tech, and this is happening here in Kenya. It's called Just Dig It. Just Dig It is using, using water harvesting techniques. So basically, they dig a hole with a form of half moon. So when precipitation goes there, it maintains the humidity and helps nature to thrive. Look at what they did in four years. And if you want to visit it, I think you just Google it. Just, uh, just dig it, and you will be able to visit it I don't know, maybe tomorrow. Um, the last example, which is for me the best example on how human can have a positive impact on the planet. This is huge. This is the great green world of Africa. A reforestation project of 8,000 kilometers from east to west of Africa, 15 kilometers wide. 
to not only fight desertification, but also mitigate climate change effects. So when they study, they just say, OK, we're going to plant trees and we're going to see. So it's working pretty well, most in, uh, in some country. And then they say, OK, but we plant trees. So we improve soil so we can cultivate, produce food, have economical impact, create jobs, and we can do carbon credits. And this is why the last reports on the Great Green World, which is called the end up potential of Great Green World value chain, is really important to read if you're interested into this subject. Okay, so if you want to create startup, you need markets. And what is nice about regenerative agriculture is like you address two types of markets. One is the oldest market in human history. It's called full market. The other one is one of the newest one, carbon credits. Okay, let's start with the first one. So, basically, today we are 7 billion people on the planet. In 2050, we're going to be 9.5 billion people on the planet. So, World Institute Resource says that we need to increase food production by 50%. But the IPCC is saying that food production is going to decrease by 30% because of climate change and biodiversity crisis. FAO is saying that we need 2 billion additional arable lands to feed this growing population. And we're losing 12 million hectares of arable lands because of desertification. Remember, one football field every two seconds. Now, I'm not good at math, but I think everyone here can see that there is a problem. And this problem like, creates a huge demand of food, a huge per perspective. And if you're looking at the graph from the World Bank, you can see that the increase in, dim in consumption will be far more important in Africa than in any other continent. So I think you all understood that it's really good to invest in uh, agriculture, either conventional, either regenerative. It's going to be good because there is a lot of money to do. But also consider that food security equal political stability. And this is also one of the reasons food production is highly subsidized by government. OK, now you know everything about food markets perspective. Let's switch to the other market, which is so new. This is so exciting. I love it. So it started with Kyoto Protocol in 1990. And it has been really launched at COP21 in Paris. So market perspective for voluntary carbon credits are really amazing. Like if you're looking at the graph, like it could increase by a factor of 15 by 2030 and a factor of 100 by, by 2050. And this study from McKinsey also states that there is a huge, they expect a huge difference between offer and demands, and this is why it's going to result in very high prices. Some people might argue, okay, carbon credit is greenwashing, but you need to reduce your consumption of meats, of goods, and so on, but you cannot reduce everything. You need to eat. You need to take transportation sometimes, try to avoid too many flights. You need to buy a phone, computer, and so you cannot reduce all your consumption, so you need to compensate. Don't forget, reduce what you can, offset what you can't. So just to finish this, I would like to talk about uh, a TED Talks, really great TED Talks, which is called The Single Biggest Reason Why Startups Succeed by Bill Gross. Six minutes, straight to the point, no blah, blah. So really, a really great TED Talks to, to, walk, to watch. So he's looking at the major factor of success for startups, and he found out that ID, funding, business model are really important factor. More important would be team and execution. But what matters the most is timing. He even argues that Airbnb and Uber wouldn't be so successful if it, if it was not because of a crisis of the subprimes pushing people to look for additional revenue. So I, I truly believe that startup is the best form of organization to make the world a better place. And I truly believe we can do that. And today, I truly believe 
you understand that this is the perfect timing for regenerative agriculture. So now it's up to you to find the other four key success of key factor of success. Thank you for your attention and feel free to shoot any questions. Well done, Ben. Thank you so much. I love the, the fact that you put so many images that make so much sense. It's just so easy to understand what we can do. Thanks, bro. That's wild. Any questions over here? I have one. I saw a hand at the back over there. I don't know if he's waving or scratching his beard. Scratching his beard. Questions? Aha. Voila. Over here. Um, maybe you can, uh, thanks for the presentation. I think it was really insightful and, and interesting. Uh, I guess you're providing solutions to um, mitigate for that. Can you, can, you walk through, can you walk us through some of those solutions and what we can effectively do to, uh, to improve? Yes, definitely. So what we do at Sensegreen, uh, we have built some protocols uh, from soil amendments. Ben, ben, to put the mic over. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Uh, so, so what we're doing at Sensor Green, uh, we have been some protocol from soil amendments to combination of trees, uh, monitoring by satellite and so on, to cultivate deserts to create plantation. So then we're going to secure some offset, offsetters such as uh, food, manufact food manufacturers as well as carbon credit buyers. And we want to franchise this model to make it accessible to everyone. Meaning like we've been cultivating some hectares in desert. We had great success. We did four years of r and But we realized that we're not going to be able to do everything by ourselves. So what we want to do, we want to franchise what we've been able to do so far and to apply it in many desertic regions. Just for your information, deserts um, represent one third on surface on Earth. So there is a lot of work to do. And I'm pretty sure we're in good timing to do so. Nice. Super clear. Any other question? No. Let's give Benjamin a hand for his Thank presentation. You. Thank you so much, good sir. I will take this. I will take this. Thank you.